All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Steve said, my name is uh, Darren Smith. I'm a non-staff uh, elder here at the Louisville campus and a member of the teaching team. And we are really excited that you're here, especially as we lead up to Holy Week and, and um, observing the resurrection of our, of our Lord and Savior. Before we get into the text and into the sermon, would you pray with me? God, our Father in heaven, we come to you and uh, we humble ourselves in your sight. Um, as we open your word, um, Lord, we, we just confess that we don't know what, what way is right. I pray that you would help us to put down um, all of our burdens, all of our notions, all of our desires, that your Holy Spirit would come to us, give us your faith, help us to see your vision, help us to feel what you feel, and teach us today, Lord. It's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Well, as, um, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we are in the middle of a little series right now called Encounters with, with Christ. And um, the idea here is that we are walking in the shoes and looking through the eyes of people who met the resurrected Christ. And, and our goal is to have a 360 degree view. So each of them has a different perspective. Each of them has different context and background. And so when, when they see Christ, there's something a little bit interesting and different about their story. And our goal today is to do that again and to be able to see through a different perspective. So far, we've looked at uh, the Apostle Peter, uh, which I think all of us can sometimes empathize with, and then Thomas, which we should all definitely be able to, to empathize with. And today, we are looking at Mary Magdalene, which is... Uh, She's just one of my personal favorite characters in the Bible. And I don't know if you're allowed to say that because every character in the Bible should be uh, your favorite because they're inspired, but, or the, the writing of it is inspired. But Mary Magdalene um, is beautiful, and, and there's some beautiful truths about her. Now, before we get into um, our text, which will be John the 20th uh, chapter, verses 1 through 18, I want to share just a little bit of background on Mary, okay? So... Um, the first thing that we have to know about Mary is that it is an incredibly common name in the, first te- in the, in the New Testament. Um, I think I read that statistics say that one out of four women were named Mary, and I don't know how they know that, but um, it seems probably just about right because um, there are uh, a, at least six Marys mentioned in the Bible. So it's really important that we understand who Mary Magdalene is and that we don't conflate her with these other Marys. So the first one, um, the big one that we all know about is, is the mother of Jesus, right? Mary, often called the Virgin Mary, um, and she's pretty easy to distinguish. Then there's another one, uh, Mary, who is the sister of Lazarus and, and Martha. So Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and you know that story of Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead and, and Mary was there. And then there's Mary, who is the mother of James and John. So Again, that's confusing in and of itself because it's another uh, mother there. And then there's Mary Magdalene. And I think there's even some references in the Bible where they say, and that other Mary, you know. So (laughs) there's a lot of Marys running around, right? Mary Magdalene has sometimes been over history confused with some of these others. Um, but, But what we do know about her is this, that she is from a little town called Magdala. So the Magdalene, right? And Magdala is on the, the western side of Galilee. Um, it's a resort city. Um, it had a lot of Greco and Roman influence, had a lot of trade. Um, and so it was a, a beautiful place. It was a beautiful place to get away, very uh, luxurious, but it was also very immoral. I would imagine if they had a, a visitor and conventions bureau, maybe their slogan might be, what happens in Magdala stays in Magdala, right? Right. So you can come here, you can get away, and you can enjoy yourself in whatever way that looks like, um, and no one will ever know. And my point in bringing this up is that to call somebody a Magdalene would not have been a compliment in high society down in Jerusalem with all the Pharisees. So when you're walking around and someone goes, oh, there goes that Magdalene, um, it's just like Nazareth, right? I mean, uh, the Bible says, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, and so that's kind of how Mary would have been looked at. But, but more importantly than that, Luke, the eighth chapter, tells us something unbelievable about Mary, that Jesus cast seven demons from her. This isn't, this isn't figurative. This is literal 
demon possession. Mary had seven demons cast from her. And so um, the reason I, you know, I want to point this out so, so strongly is that from that point on, not only was she from Magdala, not only was she a woman, which would have automatically made her a second-class citizen, but she was going to always be known as that crazy, unstable woman, right? So you can just imagine that friends and foes alike throughout the rest of her life would probably joke with her and mess around with her or criticize her or talk bad about her, right? You know, if she ever uh, lost her cool for a minute, someone might go, hey, Mary, is that a demon coming back, you know? So she's got this stigma, right, that's always going to be with her. She was crazy. She was unstable. And the Bible tells us that after these demons were cast out, she was so inspired that she left everything and began to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. She traveled with him. So for two, two plus years, she walked around the countryside with the master, And the Bible tells us that she actually supplied uh, their needs from her own means. So she took everything that she had, and as they went around, she helped supply their needs. And what a beautiful opportunity for Mary. And so that that asks me, that leads me to ask this question, why? What would inspire her to do that? And it's very simple. Mary is, is an example where you can clearly see someone moving from death to life. You can clearly see a before and after picture. Before she met Jesus and after she met Jesus, you see, she was broken. She was completely broken. She had nothing. And Jesus picked up the pieces and he put her back together. He gave her new life. We are taught that the one who was forgiven much loves much. And she loved him. She loved him. He was everything to her. And so her story is both for those of us who think we've got it all together and those of you who feel disenfranchised, those of you who feel like your life is a mess and you don't know where you're going and all those things. It's a warning. It's a warning to religious people. It's a warning. And it says Jesus doesn't come for those people. He comes for the broken. And it's, it should be hope to those who don't have hope that he comes and he brings new life. Jesus himself said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom. They shall inherit the kingdom. The broken, the lonely, the cast out, the demon possessed, the sinful, they inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who have nothing and their only treasure is in the cross. And so I would ask you this morning before we go on, can't you see yourself in Mary in some way? Whether it's a warning whether you think you got it all put together, can't you see it? Maybe you feel differently. Maybe you're coming from a background and you're thinking, I'm just coming to church today. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm coming. I don't have it together. I'm not ready for this. Jesus is ready for you. And can't you see yourself in Mary? And so she had gone all in on Jesus. I don't play cards. I don't play poker. But, you know, there's always a moment where someone goes all in, right? They think their hand is enough or they're bluffing or whatever. And they put all their money in and they force the hand. And so she has gone all in on him. She has nothing else. There's nowhere else to go back to. It's gone. Her money's gone. Everything that she has is gone. And so she comes into Jerusalem the last week, the the, the Passion Week, and she sees it all. And, And things are getting weird, man. Jesus is coming back. Um, into Jerusalem. He, he's starting to get, his, his teaching is getting more direct. Um, people are plotting against him. Uh, he's starting to talk about dying, and, and he's, he talks about the destruction of the temple and, and, and return of the Son of Man. He's talking about all these things, and it's weird. And then he's betrayed, and then she, he's crucified, and she is at the foot of the cross. There are three Marys at the foot of the cross, and she's one of those Marys, and she's there, and she saw him die. And so it was it. It was over. She saw it. But there's more to the story, right? John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple 
and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am sending to the Father and to your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? So Mary goes to the tomb. She had seen it all. She had seen the death, and she was going back to pay her respects. And she goes to the tomb, and I think she stands there, and she's looking for answers to questions. And I think that she asks three main questions. Now, she asks them either directly or indirectly. So there's some direct questions, and there's some indirect questions. But she's literally asking three things. Number one, where is Jesus? Where's the body, right? Very physical, where is he? Number two, who is Jesus? What is his identity? And then number three, what do I do with Jesus? And I wanna propose to you today that these are three questions that we have to go to the tomb and ask. And so our goal is, again, to look through the eyes of Mary to see what she saw and learn from her and that Jesus and his hope would be more beautiful to us. So the first question is a very literal question that she asks. She is going to the tomb uh, for a purpose, and when she gets there, the Bible says in verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she says this, she says, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Later on, she's like, okay, seriously, where did you put him, right? It's almost like CSI Jerusalem, they're, right? They're looking for the body, right? Where, what, what did you do with it? And you can kind of see along the way, she's getting more agitated with this. Do you want to mess with Mary? I mean, she's standing there toe to toe with these, these angels. <laughs> you know, in the Bible, a lot of times when people see angels, they fall down. Not Mary, man. She's going toe to toe with them. And we don't know what they look like and all that, but no, she's, she's, a, she's a bulldog. She's there to get a body, and she's not leaving until it. So she's asking this very straightforward question. But I, I want to pause for a minute. I don't want you to go over this too fast, because uh, the answer has unbelievably deep implications. It may be the single most important question that we can ask and answer. The question isn't, where's is his body? The question is, is he alive? Is he alive? That's the implication of this. You see, if he's not alive, if the body is there or someone has moved the body, then he's a liar. He's just a liar. He's just an imposter. Um, I think it's C.S. Lewis that says he's not even a good man because he's evil, because he's misleading everybody. And so she's asking, where's the body? 
But this is a deep theological, spiritual, philosophical question is, is this man alive? If the answer is yes, then he is very God of very God, and the world has forever changed. The world can never be the same if the answer is yes. If he's not in that tomb, everything is different. I want you to notice from this that Mary has this unbelievable devotion to him. We've already talked a little bit about that. We talked about her background, where she came from. She gave everything she had, and yet she was the one that wasn't going to leave. She was the one that was there. She was the one fighting to honor and respect him. But despite everything that she had seen and everything she had experienced, she didn't get it. She still did not get it. I want you to think about what Mary had either seen firsthand or what she had firsthand accounts of. Um, She had seen him calm storms, big storms. (laughs) She had seen him heal the sick. She had seen people who had been lame um, on mats their entire life get up and walk. She had seen him cast demons out of other people, and she had seen him cast demons out of herself. And I don't know um, the horror that that would have been, but Mary felt that. She saw that. She saw the empty tomb. She saw the grave clothes. She saw angels, and she saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Yet, she came with an assumption that he was still dead. And so, she keeps asking for the body. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? But she's really getting to the question, is is he alive? So, as grand as her devotion was to him, and it was grand, her estimate of Jesus was far too small. So her devotion was grand, but her estimate was too small. Is our devotion grand and our estimate too small today? Is Jesus able to do everything in your life? There is an absolute human impossibility of faith. Absolute human impossibility of faith. John, earlier in John, Jesus himself said in chapter 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You see, so we learn from Mary that faith is not this gift that you, you wrap up and you give God. <laughs> it's not a gift that you give God. It's a gift that, that he gives you. And I love Jesus gently coming to her. He comes to her. She never would have found him alone And he gently says her name, Mary. He is risen. That's the answer. He is risen. I want to look uh, for a brief moment today. We're going to look at three passages from the book of Colossians. I love the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians is written just a, a couple of decades, a few decades after these events took place. And what's happening in the book of Colossians is that there's a thing that, that people are coming in and they're teaching that Jesus is, is good, that Jesus is fine, but you have to do something extra to unlock the keys to pleasing God. And there was some Judaism mixed into there, and there was some Greek philosophy, but, but regardless, what they were saying is that Jesus is good, yes, that's fine, you can have your Jesus, uh, Colossians, you know, the, the church at Colossae, you can have that, but, but you've got to do some extra stuff. And, and Paul is writing to correct that. And the, the theme of the entire book is Christ is all. Christ is all. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1 verse 17, Paul writes this. He says, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. I love the book of Colossians because if you don't get this truth, if you're kind of wishy-washy on the fact that he's not in that tomb, that he's alive, that he's risen, on down the line, other things will start to creep in and you're going to put Jesus off to the side like the Colossians were starting to do. And I love what he says there, that he is preeminent. He's not in the tomb. The body has not been moved. He's the firstborn from among the dead. And this changes everything. So here's my point. You and I figuratively have to walk to that tomb today. 
every day. We have to walk to that tomb and we have to look in and we have to say, is he risen or did somebody move the body? We have to ask those questions. You see, we still live under the curse of sin. Now, we've been redeemed from it, but this world is still broken, right? So we're still living in that time period before Christ sets it all right. And so we live under that, and the wages of sin is death, and that brings separation and loneliness. So when we get wishy-washy about this topic, is Christ in the tomb or not? When we get wishy-washy, we start to feel the effects of all of that, right? All sin and its effects are because we don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. When we sin and when, we, when, when, when we're afraid and when we're lonely and dejected and when we're going to go at it on our own, we get mad and angry and we're living this life apart from Jesus Christ, it's because we don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Period. End of story. So um, I'm going to share something with you today I don't like to talk about, about myself, um, but it's a very real anxiety I have. Um, <clears throat> I have developed what I would call a moderate to severe fear of flying, of airplanes. And, uh, you know, I have to travel for my job, and um, I've always traveled for my job, um, but I'm, I'm terrified sometimes. And um, it's, uh, it's dehabilitating. It really is. Um, you can talk to my wife about it. It's real fun for her. Um, I will say this, uh, about 10 years ago, I was on a plane that um, lost engine on, on takeoff, and as we were taking off, the, the plane starts to list, and it sounded like somebody had wrenches, and we were throwing them around in a metal toolbox in the back. We smelt jet fuel. It was, it was uh, two minutes of terror. It was fun. And, and they took us out over the, the desert, and um, the, the pilot said, hey, you guys, everything's okay, you know, we could probably make it to Dallas, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and land. And as soon as we landed, there's, you know, fire trucks and they're all spraying it down and stuff. And um, anyway, that's my story. So I've developed this, this fear. And, um, you know, I've, I've tried to deconstruct this. It's something I really struggle with, but I, I just want to admit it to you today. When it comes down to it, I, it's just that in that moment, I don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. That, that's all it is. It comes down to that. It comes down to the fact that I'm sitting there and I think like by not getting on a plane that I'm going to preserve my life. It's like a, a holy juke, right? It's like I'm faking out Jesus, right? Faking out God. Am I going to get on that plane today, right? How silly is that? How sinful is that? That I can control that situation. And my point to you today is that you have that same thing. I have other things too. You have things in your life like that. Things that cause you anxiety, control issues, fear, loneliness, all these things. I don't know what those are, but the, the root of that issue is that we don't see Jesus out of that tomb. We go expecting him to still be there. Either someone moved that body or he's alive. <laughs> There's only two options. He was alive and everything changed. We sing this song, um, and it's beautiful. Um, it's called Death Was Arrested. It says, Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin, your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Jesus is exactly who he said he is. He's not in that tomb. Stop going to the tomb and looking for him. He has risen. Then we get to the second question, and this is a little bit more of an indirect question, uh, that, and and there's, this, there's this exchange, and they keep asking her, woman, why are you weeping? And she thinks that Jesus is the gardener, right? So she actually thinks Jesus is the gardener, and she, I could just see her wagging her finger, right? Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where he is, and I'll go take him away, right? I'm not messing around anymore. It's been a long week. Um, I'm, I'm tired. I'm sad. I'm lonely. I'm going to go get him. <clears throat> and, and then he speaks her name, and she calls him teacher, we see that she finds the body, right? <laughs> oh, there's the body. Okay, got it. Check mark. Question number one's gone. Now it starts to raise the question of his identity. And she is talking directly to the master. And I love that she thinks he might be the gardener, right? How unassuming is Jesus? But what would you expect from Jesus? The king of kings was born in the most lowly way possible. How would you expect him to return? This is it. Gentle and humbly, 
Now, before we get too hard on, on Mary here, like, how did you not know Jesus, right? Um, this happens to you and me all the time. You'll see somebody out of context. If you see somebody out of context, something that you're not expecting, again, she wasn't expecting the Savior to be risen. So if you see somebody out of context, you won't always recognize them. I, a few years ago, I was, I'll be very brief with this story because it's not really that good of a story, but I was down in an oil change place and I was talking to a guy that looked vaguely familiar to me and I was just like, you know, uh, talking about a lot of stuff that I don't know about, like football. I have a lot of opinions about it, but I don't have a lot of knowledge. And so I'm just going back and forth and this guy's really nice. He's like, what's your, what's your name? I said, Darren Smith. He goes, oh yeah, one of my favorite players is Darren Smith. I said, I know, he played at Miami. That should have been my first clue. And I was like, then he played at the Cowboys. He's like, yeah, he did, he did. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm a coach and I'm just leaving my job at the University of Kansas. And I was like, oh, it's Dave Campo. Like, okay, you're, all right. So, hey, remember that time you were the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, right? Um, and that's kind of silly because I didn't walk with him. I didn't really know him, but I'd seen him countless times and it was kind of embarrassing. And again, I told him a lot of hot sports opinions about football that he was probably rolling his eyes about. But you can do this too. You do it all the time. You see people out. You don't know if, if it's them or not. And so she's doing this. She's not expecting him. And on top of all that, he addresses her as woman, very formal, very cold woman. What are you, what are you looking at? But when he spoke her name, she recognized him. When, she spoke, when, he, when he spoke her name, she knew him. And, and when Jesus speaks your name, powerful things happen. Do you hear him today speaking your name? He is speaking your name. And she sees him as she calls him Rabboni, and she runs to hold him. And you can see the love and the tenderness. And so she goes and she grabs him. She calls him teacher and she grabs him. And he says, uh, literally there, he's saying, don't hold me so tightly. I heard a commentator say, stop pinching me. So you, <laughs> you, can, you can see that she's holding him and grabbing him and she's excited. She's so happy to see him. He says, but I'm not yet ascended. So what's the point in this exchange? Back to the question, who is he? You see, things have changed. Things have changed in their relationship. Not in the tenderness, not in the love, not in the devotion, but Jesus is now different. He's not just her teacher. And things aren't going to go back the way that they were before. He's saying, I'm ascending and there's going to be a new way to hold me. Don't hold me so tightly. Don't cling to me so tightly. I'm going away. But more importantly, there's going to be a new way for me to hold you. Remember what I said? All sin and its effects are because we don't believe Jesus is who he says he is. And he is now telling us, I am, I am God. That's what he's saying, a declaration of this. Back to Colossians. Again, Jesus is supreme. That's the point, Colossians 1.19, just a, a verse later. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood on the cross. He's not just a moral man. He's not just a teacher. He is God. So like Mary, we are forced to go to the tomb and decide who he is. Either he's an imposter or he's a Lord and Savior but he is not of your making. He is not who you think he is. He is who he says he is. Thomas said in John 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. He's more than a teacher. He's a savior. We sing this beautiful old hymn, I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene. One of those verses says, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden on Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous. And my song shall always be. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He is not a good man. He is not just a teacher. He is our Lord and our God. That's who he is. So then that brings us to the third question. Again, another indirect question. What do I do with Jesus? The Bible says <coughs> in verse 18 that she ran. She ran and she said, I have seen the Lord. 
So if you come around to my house, I have three boys and I like to mess with them. It's sort of the way that I pay them back for being sloppy and pigs and not paying any rent. So I like to joke around with them a lot, you know, and they roll their eyes. They're seven, five, and three. Um, and I'm, I'm just like the trick question guy, right? I love trick questions. I love to just tease them and, and mess around with them. And so I've kind of thrown a trick question into, uh, into our sermon today. What do I do with Jesus? The, the truth of the matter is, you don't do very much. He does it to you. He chooses you. You see, there's a divine priority of grace. This is a, this is a woman, um, again, second-class citizen in that time. She's deranged. Um, she's on the outside looking in. She has nothing left, and he comes to her. And Don't you see that that is the message of the gospel, the message of the Bible? It's not about your merit. It's not about what you've done, your past. It's about Jesus and his past. It's about the finished work in the tomb. It's about him, and he comes to you. And Jesus uses the broken. He tends to go to those who will listen. Again, a warning, a warning to us. He goes to those who will listen. And so he has risen, and the world is forever changed. And she is so inspired that she runs and she announces it and she tells the disciples. And so there is an action to take. It's not how you earn your salvation. He comes to you so you don't earn it, but there is a reaction to it. There is a difference in your life. There's something that we do. We go, we take action. You see, this isn't just a spiritual story with great principles, guys. This is history. So we can cast it off or we can accept it, but we don't dumb it down. Don't dumb it down. Hate it or receive it, but you can't like it. The cross of Jesus Christ is offensive. It's offensive to you, and it's offensive to other people, and you either have to submit to it or leave it, but it's not just something that we can kind of be okay with. What do you do with Jesus? It's what he does. Colossians 1 verse 21 says, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see, we are all like Mary. And there's two equally bad reactions that we can do today. Um, we can leave and we can just ignore it. Um, sometimes Audrey, my wife, will bring up something. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we just need to bury, bury that real deep and never talk about it again, right? That's, that's how I like to usually handle conflict and things. Just bury that real deep. See, you can't do that with Jesus. You can't ignore him. And you can't think you deserve him either. The tomb shouts to us, it's not about you. It's about Jesus' completed work. Colossians says we've gone from alienated hostile and evil to holy, blameless, above reproach, restored. So what do you do? You surrender and you embrace that joy. We sing this song, Restoration. We say, you've taken my pain, you've called me by a new name. Sounds like Mary, doesn't it? You've taken my pain, you've called me by a new name. You've taken my shame and in its place, you've given me joy. So we're standing at the tomb today and I would just ask you, do you see him? What do you see when you look into the tomb? Do you hear him? He's calling your name. Jesus is risen. Would you stop looking for a body? He's Lord and God. He's more than just a teacher. And he presents you and me as holy and blameless. Surrender and tell other people. So there are only three questions that matter in this whole world. I, I, really, I really mean that. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I think where is he, who is he, and what is he? The answers gave Mary, the answers Jesus gave Mary are the same ones that he gives you and me today. And this is the hope of the risen Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let me pray. God, we come to you today and we thank you so much for the the truth of the resurrection. We thank you so much that this is not a story, a fable. It's not a good idea. That it, This is literal history that, that Jesus was in that tomb dead. 
that he conquered hell and death and he came back to life, that he was there waiting for Mary at the tomb. Lord, as we stand there today and we look around and we're full of fear and doubt and anxiety and we ask these same questions every single day, Lord, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit would come to us. I pray your Spirit would give us your faith. We need you. We need you terribly today and we are nothing without you. And Lord, would you inspire us today to run out of here and to tell everybody we know that we have seen the Lord, that he has risen and that he is our Savior and our God. We just thank you for the beauty of Jesus Christ, that he knows our name, that he calls us. Lord, call us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.